Um, hi everyone, I'm Dan Crossley from the Food Ethics Council. Um, I am, the Food Ethics Council is a UK not-for-profit. Uh, it's been around for 25 years uh, and we're all about bringing people and organisations together to try to uh, unblock some of the really difficult, big ethical issues around food and farming. Um, we've just heard from Sabrina some of the massive, massive global challenges that we face in our food systems um, and it can be quite bleak. Uh, I guess what I'm here to do today is to talk a little bit, I guess, a bridge bridge between the, the kind of global, um, some of the global issues we've heard about and the, the very, very local. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the kind of national picture um, and the sort of and some some things that are going on at a more local level uh, before I think Dave talk about um, perhaps household food insecurity. So there's so four things I'll talk about. Firstly, just a word or two on food security. Um, secondly, I'll talk about food citizenship and explain what we mean by that, and why that's important. Um, thirdly, talk about community food resilience. Um, and then finally, just share some examples uh, of some, what I think is some some good stuff happening at a kind of grassroots, grassroots level that we should be doing more of and should be trying to create the conditions so that more of that can flourish. So that's the answer, food security, food citizenship, community food resilience and examples of good stuff happening. And I'll try to inject, if you like, some positivity and some hope in our note, what can be quite a, uh, dark and uh, challenging uh, dis discussion around you know, food security and uh, and and the future of the future of food. We get into issues about hunger and obesity and inequality, um, climate crises, biodiversity crisis, um, which can be quite disempowering. But I guess I'm keen to uh, not to gloss over those, but to to I guess raise the hope that we can we can change things. So, firstly, food security um, means lots of different things to different people. Um, I like the um, the, the kind of Colin Tudge definition of, of good food for everyone forever. Um, so good food for everyone forever, which to me feels like a, uh, a kind of nice uh, nice definition that people get their heads around and um, that obviously takes into account impact on future generations. Uh, crucially, uh, good food for everyone. Um, and we're clearly a long way away from that at the moment. Um, the you know the UK picture at the moment is um, is pretty bleak. There's been some uh, new report out recently, the Broken Plate from Food Foundation, which sets out. I won't repeat all that here, but that sets out some clear markers as to as to how we're doing at the UK level. Um, and I'm sure Dave will talk about the sort of household food food insecurity um, and the real challenges we're facing in the UK. Um, so I'm going to make no apologies about here talking about the UK um, situation, but clearly within that global context and to echo Sabrina's point, I think it's critically important that we take that internationalist outlook. Um, so for me, that's, yeah, that's critically important. Um, the, on, on, so food security is something that uh, we're, you know, I, in my, in my book and uh, with my personal hat on, I don't think we should necessarily be aspiring for, for self-sufficiency, but I think we should, there's, we should be shifting uh, a lot more of our focus uh, towards making uh, making us self-sufficient in those products and crops where it makes sense. Um, so we can can still trade, but I think we should be promoting the, the more localized food systems um, with short supply chains, um, taking up the, the middle people, to me makes a lot of sense. Um, I do think that we need that mix of, of bottom up and top down. Uh, so we do need some steer from government, from national government and local government. We need that framework. Um, and that's sorely lacking in the UK at the moment. Uh, there's a real, a real dearth of, dearth of leadership and dearth of direction. Um, so I looked to places like Scotland with their Good Food Nation Act brought in recently as a, as an, a good example, not perfect, but good example of that framework that's trying to join up food and ag agriculture and environment and health and so on. So there are examples out there of governments that are national governments that are are moving things in a better direction. So food security um, is, yeah, for me, is it's uh, something we should be striving for every day. Um, but the, the, at a national level, as I said, we're really struggling and globally, clearly there are massive issues. Um, moving on from food security, and the second thing I wanted to talk about was food citizenship. Uh, and these are all interconnected, but just to, I guess, explain what we mean by food citizenship. Um, so we, you know, we know we live in a world with millions of people going hungry. There are lots of empty calories and industrialized food production, um, creating lots of damage and waste. Um, and communities are being increasingly relied on to fill that gap. 
um, and you know that rising tide of hunger and poverty that we hear about a lot. Um, so I guess what we talk about with food citizenship is it's an idea, a mindset, way of thinking, um, way of seeing and defining ourselves and each other, and the idea that we all have power to make positive change in the food systems, and that we should have access to affordable health, sustainable food. Um, so at its core, and I say this to, I suspect people in this audience will be bought into this notion already, um, it's saying that when we hear ourselves described as citizens and are treated as citizens, uh, rather than as cons helpless consumers at the end of a long chain, then our capacity to act and get involved and make changes in our lives um, and in our communities is so much greater. So for me, it's a it's a, a must have rather than a nice to have that we, you know, um, for anyone working in the in the food system in whatever capacity. Um, what I'll do is just put up a a couple of slides just for the sort of second part of this, just to um, illustrate some of this. Um, hopefully, it will be helpful. So this is a quote from um, D Woods, who I suspect some of you will know, who is one of our council members, um, but also involved in lots and lots of different things, including Granville Community Kitchen in, in North London. Um, I just love this quote from her, um, which I'll read out very quickly. Food citizenship is much more than having the privilege to choose good food. It's about having individual and collective agency within a society where capitalism, social inequities and a complex food web intersects. It demands of us a responsibility to be truly humanitarian, to be protectors of nature, and to stand for real democ democracy and human rights. Our food citizenship places us as rights bearers at the heart of the right to food, to hold our government accountable of its, to its duty to ensure all people are able to access culturally appropriate, healthy, sustainable, and just food. Now, that is quite a long, uh, long two or three sentences, but um, the heart of that is, yeah, it's that idea that we are, we are citizens, we are, we do have we need to connect ourselves with the power that we have as citizens uh, and in the context of food there, that opens up so many more opportunities um, than if we think of ourselves as consumers when our only opportunity to influence the food system is the size of our wallet whether we have a big enough wallet to be able to afford to buy organic or whatever the uh, equivalent might be so the food citizenship mindset is this idea we you know we are citizens as global citizens um, we can shape the food system we participate, we create, not just choose from what we're given. Um, we get involved, we are collaborative, we are empathetic. Um, we've done lots on this. Again, I won't go into detail now for reasons of time, but on food citizenship, which is on our on the website foodcitizenship.info. Um, and you can see here this this is around the kind of communications of it. So a lot of this, you know, I guess the argument is we think if we ch change the words and change the narrative, we begin to change the system. And um, so if we if we change away from that transactional us versus them, um, you know, uh, and based, you know, relying on assumptions that, as we heard before, that from from some that we need to, you know, we need to double food production, um, or you know, uh, we haven't got enough food in the world. Clearly, there is enough food uh, produced in the world, but as it's, it's not distributed evenly. Um, so, but if we shift that to a more inclusive, um, you know, relational uh, think, recognizing that we do have we do have power to change things if we're given the opportunity to, and if we change what's around us. So, so this, some of this is taken from work by New Citizenship Project and John Alexander, who was involved with Food Ethics Council for a long time. Um, this idea of how do we shift from, from sort of to to with, how can we do things with people? How can we how can we do talk about we rather than us and them? How can we talk about purpose and participating and shaping and adapting, etc.? Uh, I won't read them all out, but you get you get the gist. Um, it's this notion of doing, doing things with people, involving people. Um, is is incredibly powerful, um, and we we applied this food citizenship lens, if you like, so the shift from we need from consumer to citizen. Apply this to uh, thinking about food and poverty, and um, at a kind of household level, and, and thinking nationally as well. Um, and some of this is, uh, I guess, the conclusion of some work we did on community food resilience was the, some of the reframes that we think are needed um, from, uh, which I'll, I'll come on to in a minute. But before I do that, just to say. Community food resilience, the, the, the notion is, I mean, it, it's, it does what it says on the tin. Um, you know, we, we know that we need to be more resilient. We need more resilient food systems in the face of the shocks that we, we, we know about. We know they're coming and aren't going to go away. So how can we show love and care for communities through, through our food and the, through the experience of eating, sharing, cooking? And that's critically important in building up community resilience, that resilience from the bottom up. So how do we reframe from you know, consumers who can't afford food to citizens who can participate and can shape a food environment. 
from food as a commodity to, to food as a social connector, from charity to exchange and reciprocity, um, from meeting a need to building capacity, um, and how can we use the, sort of the Cormac Russell build on what's strong, not what's wrong mentality. Um, again, that's not um, in any way ignoring everything that's wrong, um, but it's it's sort of going where the positive energy is and trying to build from that rather than getting sometimes getting paralyzed by um, the negativity and, and all the huge multiple crises that we that we face. Um, the so food security and food citizenship, as I said, is for me is uh, is a mindset shift that we need to go through in order to get closer to good food for everyone forever. Um, and involving people is a vital part of that. Um, if you apply that, if you bring in uh, food citizenship, um, then it helps us think about community food resilience rather than um, getting stuck on issues of inequality and poverty, people struggling to eat, um, and the sort of consumer consumer trap that we're that we're stuck in. Um, the final thing I wanted to do in the last just the last two or three minutes is just I'm just literally just going to download a few examples of was asked to was asked to share some examples of, of sort of positive things that are happening at the local level. Uh, and uh, before I do that, the one thing just to share at a kind of more national level but that's relevant, I think, for the conversation and what um, uh, what people here, including Alicia, are trying to do is this uh, people's food policy that was developed a few years ago um, with Land Workers Alliance and others um, kind of leading leading on that, but involved many, many people um, developing. Uh, so it's very much a bottom up grassroots policy. Um, so looking at those areas, you can see there from around health, land, labour, environment, knowledge, trade, etc. Um, so there are there are some things material resources out there already that can be uh, drawn on i think part of the value is is the process as much as the outcome so it's not to say job done um but i think there is um, there are definitely useful resources which you can um you can uh, draw on i'm just going to come back into the main body just to, just to talk through um i guess a smattering of i could be here for hours but of, of examples of things that are happening at a very local level and i guess the thing that binds them together is um, that notion of sort of by the people for the people. So whether it's um, a new green grocers that's just about to open next week in Northern Ireland in Carrick Fergus that my colleague um, Beth Bell is involved in, uh, which is a a community owned green grocer. Um, they they say in their in their literature, you know, we're a welcoming hub in the town centre that provides opportunities for for learning, community interaction, and engagement. So they are wanting to serve serve local nutritious food but as much as anything they're a you know they're a, they're a social space social hub connector and using food as a way to bring people together um for me those those kind of examples are, are really powerful um there are the organizations like foodworks in sheffield a social enterprise um uh, again doing really interesting work and that's about they uh, rather than um give uh, you know rather than sort of giving free food to people in need um they they have a different model again i won't go into detail here but they 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 there's very little distinction between sort of staff and volunteers it's not the kind of us and them mentality they don't have a gatekeeping system that will um, say only if you meet these criteria can you come in basically it's this notion of everyone's welcome and again that's a common theme through lots of the examples that i could share um so things like um Granville Community Kitchen, again, I touched on it before in North London, run by the community for the community, that culture of participation, mutual exchange. Um, in Manchester, things like Kindling Farm, uh, which is opening soon. I think Kindling Trust, really exciting. Manchester Urban Diggers, as um, CSA in Manchester, we visited recently um, with a really inspiring story. Co Farm in Cambridge. Um, you know, I, I, So there are the point you know, in Leeds, there's a thing called Catch. In the city, um, which is a you know, community action to create hope, um, a space for young people, including those that have been excluded or expelled, um, to come together. And there's things like food buses, educational farm, community cafe, um, but it's run by by the young people. So I could go on. There are lots and lots and lots of initiatives at a local level. Clearly, lots of them uh, uh, rely on people with passion to drive them forward. Um, they often don't have the funding and the networks and things that they that would make them really flourish. But there are loads of brilliant examples out there. And if we if we step away from individual initiatives and think about networks, things like Incredible Edible, um, and some of the policy work they're doing around community right to grow, I think are really exciting. Um, the sort of seed sovereignty movement again was touched on before. We've got our foundation involved. 
Um, if you think about land, ecological land co-op, you know, their work to support new entrants to access land and some of the influencing they're trying to do on rural policy um, at a kind of council, a sort of city level and regional level in, over, in, over in Ireland, Cork, Cork Food Policy Council is an example of where they're trying to influence local food policy for a partnership of the community representatives, retailers, local authority, etc. So there are, I'll, I'll, there are, there are a lot, there's lots going on in, in all four nations of the UK um, and beyond as well. Um, which for me is really exciting. So I guess my my kind of take home message is um, whilst we are um, lots of the um, lots of the I guess the the graphs of uh, how we're doing on obesity, on climate, on nature, um, and, and on you know, insecurity, uh, inequality are, uh, are are really really bleak and are often going in, in the wrong direction. That there are some uh, some seeds of hope on which we can build. So yeah, I think we we need to nourish those, nurture those, um, and, and let those flourish and encourage those to flourish. And I think having some some uh, grassroots policy to support that would be would be really powerful. But with that, I will pause. Thank you.